Welcome to this edition of Fraud Talk, the ACFE's monthly podcast. I'm Emily Primo, Associate Editor of Fraud Magazine, and I'm joined by Andrew Snyder. Andrew is the host of the Prison Life podcast, and he recently wrote an article for Fraud Magazine about insider trading, which we'll discuss more about today. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. Thank you for having me, Emily. So to get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and your Prison Life podcast? My career began with the uh, California Department of Corrections in the early 80s. I was uh, 20-something, began as a correctional officer working in uh, Vacaville at the California Medical Facility. Worked there inside the prison for, uh, I guess, five years. Went on later to work at headquarters and then left the department, retired, and started my uh, private investigation business. And I did that for about 14 years, worked in insurance defense, corporate investigations. And uh, then it was about uh, 2003, four. I was ready to write a new chapter, and I, I moved to Hawaii to go to grad school and uh, became a marriage and family therapist uh, with the intention of of working in forensics. And it was about that time after graduation, I uh, came across a documentary, Unraveled, about Mark Dreyer. And uh, he was a prominent attorney in New York City that got caught up in, in some fraud. I think the totals were about $400 million. The documentary focused on his house arrest. They interviewed him pending sentencing. And uh, at that time, they had a consultant come in to work with Dreyer in preparation for going off to prison. And the light went off and said, you know, I can do that. Basing my background in corrections with my uh, knowledge and training in marriage family therapy to consult with white collar offenders who have never been in trouble with the law before that are heading off to prison, giving them some tips some information uh, about what prison is, and then also how it affects the family, because it does. Yeah, I can imagine. That's really interesting, the segue from what you did to start your career, and then there are a couple things along the way, and then kind of coming back to that with your correctional officer background. Indeed. So how did that segue into the podcast? What's the podcast like? I work with primarily federal offenders that are going to go to prison, and oftentimes they're out on bail most times. Also, they're allowed to self-report because many of them are going to be going to prison camps, and they will have our two or three months to, to get their affairs in order before they, they report to prison. So I will meet with them during that time of freedom, and oftentimes they have permission to travel. So I either go to them or they come to me, and we work on that matter. But In terms of the podcast, I've interviewed some of these people who've been in the the media because of their, their cases, the notoriety, to give others information about the process, how they got to to the point that they crossed the line and got into trouble, and how it affected them personally and professionally. It's really incredible to hear some of the stories. These are smart educated people who got into a uh, a crisis, if you will, personal crisis that was unmanageable and led to criminal activity that they were prosecuted for and, and um, resulted in them going to prison. Yeah. And so, t- so to go to the Scott London case, you actually wrote about that in the 2017 March-April issue of Fraud Magazine. You wrote about the Scott London case and a couple other cases that have to do with insider trading. Can you tell us a little bit more about that case, kind of from start to finish? Scott London was a senior partner at KPMG, had been working with them for 30 years. He started with them, that firm, uh, out of college. I had worked with him, advanced, promoted to a uh, senior executive level, and was discovered in 2013 to have been providing inside information to his friend, uh, Brian Shaw. And he and Brian had known each other for five years already, 
before it began. They had met at a country club there in Southern California, were golf buddies. Brian Shaw owned a uh, family business um, dealing in jewelry. And at the 2008-9 downturn in the economy, his business took a hit. You know, luxury items like that, people will uh, not purchase, you know, making priorities. And so I guess the point came where he asked Scott London for information that could help him in his trading that could make up for the sum of the lost uh, business income. And, and it evidently, and this isn't uncommon, we've seen other insider trading cases that are born out of golfing buddies and, and the golf course. A lot of business is done on the golf course, and loose lips will uh, sink ships, uh, as they say. And he had already, Shaw had already pieced together bits of information where Scott had been traveling what he had been doing and, and working on and making trades that were beginning to pay off. But he finally approached the subject with, with Scott and said, uh, you know, I've been trading on this, and if I get more information, I can make more money. So they hatched a plan to begin this, uh, this scheme. The idea was to, to keep it low, the trades low, so that they could fly under the radar of detection and um, it went on for, what, about two years, I guess, two years plus. And ultimately, uh, FINRA, uh, a watchdog agency on Wall Street, detected suspicious trades by uh, Brian Shaw. His account was, was suspended. He was notified, and uh, London was also told. But then later a subpoena came from the SEC. They wanted to investigate. And this time, Brian Shaw didn't mention it to London, got an attorney, and they began cooperating with the uh, FBI. There were some recordings between Shaw and Scott London uh, about certain public announcements that would be made on certain companies. And then there was an exchange of cash at a parking lot that was uh, photographed by a surveillance team. And then the FBI agents went and, and uh, visited Scott London at home and told him, you know, we're here about the insider trading with uh, his friend, Shaw. And Scott London confessed, told him everything, and then he had to mentioned this news to his, his family as well his bosses at KPMG, and they let him go. He was uh, summarily fire, fired, and uh, then it hit the news, and it was big. It was national news, and it caught my attention. Why was someone with that career at that level, why would he engage in this activity? And uh, one of the clips on the news was of Scott London at his attorney's office. And, and I, I suppose, I don't know, Scott never told me this, but I think they were trying to get ahead of the news before the court proceedings in terms of explaining what he had done and the consequences. But at any rate, I could see the anguish uh, on his face, how uncomfortable this was for him to stand before national media and try to explain why he did something so unethical and illegal. And it just caught my attention. Well, we happened to speak a couple times before he went off to prison, and then he came out. I had sent him an email and, and asked if he would like to come on the, uh, the show uh, to do a podcast interview. And he agreed, and he was forthright, explained all the nuances of his case. It gave some background as to how this could come about. So in your personal opinion, why do you think he decided to insider trade? Was it because of his concern over his friend having financial troubles, or do you think there was more to it than that? I think it was a perfect storm of events that came together. Having talked with Scott London a number of times, I, I sense that he is the helping sort, 
the type of person that will help his friends, help at work, help at home. He'll engage, and he cares about other people. I believe that. I think he also had lost his commitment to the company, and then he misplaced his loyalty. If this had happened midway in his career, um, I don't think, uh, meaning having Shaw ask for insider information, I think he would have been able to draw that boundary, that line. But at that point in his career, he had been working, doing audits for nine years. He had been asking for the last three for a, a different post, a different job position. He was getting worn out. And from what he explained in the podcast interview, there were emails, there were assurances made, and he was even told, he explained, that if you find your replacement, we'll go ahead and make that move. And he had presented a, at least a couple names, but nothing came about uh, from it. And I, I think, and he said it, that he felt betrayed, um, stranded, if you will. And that, I think, played on his commitment to work. And here he had a friend that was in need, and he crossed the line. So I, I think it, it was a number of factors that led up to that. I remember having a talk with Walt Pavlo, who will go out and speak to, to colleges um, at, at business uh, students. And it, you, you're talking with an audience in their 20s, and they swear they would never do this. But later in life, in your 40s, given the right circumstances, you might be tempted to do it. And, and the reason being is life happens. You know, you've got kids, you've got a wife, there could be a bankruptcy happening, a divorce, so on and so forth. And people aren't thinking clearly and making wise decisions, and they can slip up and cross the line. The foundation of our teaching is the fraud triangle, and basically everything you just explained fits into that triangle. They have the pressures, the family, the commitments, the money problems. They have the opportunities because of whatever position they're in at that point in their career. And then it sounds like, in Scott London's case, he rationalized it by saying, I'm not getting what I want out of this company, and why shouldn't I get some for myself? Right. So to go back quickly to the article, you compare insider trading to espionage, which is an interesting crossover, I think. Why do you think the two are similar? Stealing of information. You have confidential private information of a company that's being released for the purpose of personal gain or benefiting another entity. You have espionage and in the spying sense uh, for other countries, then you have industrial espionage, and, and there are links. And in fact, I think it was during the Bush uh, administration, there were arguments within the Department of Justice about linking um, or, or treating insider trading cases like espionage. And then in the Obama administration, at the DOJ, it, it shifted, and that's when they started really prosecuting the insider trading cases. But you've got people taking information for their own enrichment or to help someone else. We had the study I mentioned in the article from a USC economist who went back a number of years and studied all of these insider trading cases, and he found 90% are men, they're in their 40s, and they're trading amongst close social and family ties. And that's what happens in the espionage world as well. I also mentioned the case of the book's Family of Spies. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name, but um, he had the uh, his brother, his son, himself and a good friend, all stealing Navy secrets and passing it along to the Russians. 
And he had done that for, I think, 20 years. Do you have any advice for fraud examiners that investigate insider trading? What red flags do you think they should be looking for? I'm thinking about Rumi Khan. You know, Rumi Khan's case, it was her second time being caught for providing uh, insider information. In the first case, she was working at Intel there in the Bay Area, California, and they knew information was being released, but they didn't know who was doing it. And they had set up uh, surveillance cameras over a fax machine that was being used to, to send off this information. They caught her on tape, on video, sending out faxes, and it was to Raj Rajaratnam at the Galleon Group in New York uh, City, who was a uh, big-time trader, hedge fund owner. But to answer your question, people who've got a gripe with the company, who think they may not have been advanced and promoted on a timely basis, according to their times, whether it's legitimate or not, someone who's got a gripe with the company might be a risk and should be looked at. So thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you very much for having me, Emily. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Fraud Talk. You can find more episodes at acfe.com slash podcast and in the iTunes store where you can leave us feedback or continue the conversation in the ACFE community at connect.acfe.com. You can also access Andrew's Prison Life podcast in the iTunes store. This has been Emily Primo signing off.